Good morning. That was not very reflective of my energy and my excitement this morning. But how y'all doing? All right, excellent. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. I'm going to be looking at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 this morning. We're taking a step into the New Testament from where we've been the last two days, which has been in the Old Testament. I am actually going to ask you to do something. I know this is perhaps not your normal, or at least not the normal for this week. Um, uh, but I'm going to ask you, um, on behalf of my <laughs> tradition when I read God's Word, especially a passage like this, I would like you to stand out of respect for God's Word. So if you would stand for just a moment. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. You follow along as I read. <clears throat> and then we'll dive into the passage together. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance Proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Thank you. You may be seated. The theme verse this week is out of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, Therefore... Let us now draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Just as a little review, we've been working through different components of this this week by looking at how it's illustrated in the Bible. On Monday, we looked at Naaman and how he had a need, didn't he? He had a need to be helped. Yesterday, we looked at Moses and how he had a fear a fear of, of, of um, uh, up, upsetting his family, upsetting his life, upsetting his comfort. He, he had all these excuses. And yet we are told in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 that we are to draw near with confidence. That word confidence has behind it the idea of uh, boldness or fearlessness. Or even, this is an interesting part of the, the spectrum of definitions on that word confidence, freedom of speech. Meaning that we can come before the God of creation and pour our, out our heart to him. If you're like, no, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Go to the Psalms. Go to the Psalms and read how the psalmist would cry out before God. And many times in those psalms, he would cry out before God some, some ghastly things. And yet, so often in those psalms, we come back to a place where the person who is approaching the Lord is humbled by the greatness and awe of the Lord. One of my great burdens for every follower of Christ, in fact, every person, because I, I would believe in this room there are people who would say, yes, I'm a Christian. Um, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. And there are other people that are like, I understand about Christianity. I'm just not there yet. One of my great hopes for you, and, and today specifically as we look at this passage, is that you would understand that one of the greatest gifts that God can give to you is peace with himself. Do you believe that you can have peace with God? We, we 
when I was growing up, whenever somebody would ask the big um, philosophical question, if you could have anything in the world, what, you, what would you ask for? And the typical answer, the almost cliche answer was, I would ask for world peace. And I don't hear that very much anymore. I, I think perhaps to some people, they feel like that's a, a, a dream that will never happen, and so maybe they don't ask that anymore. But I have a dream for you guys, if, if I can say it like that. I have a dream that you would understand every single day of your life that you can know for certain that you are at peace with God. Why do I say that? Well, one of the big reasons is I lived many years of my life being saved but not at peace with God. Did you know you can can have a relationship with God and not be at peace with Him. In Germany, many of you understand at least some of the circumstances surrounding um, uh, the Nazis and, and what they did. There are, two, um, there are two camps in Germany that have become infamous, Auschwitz and Dada. Two of these camps were concentration camps, or (laughs) death camps, to be a little bit more frank about it. Over these two camps, as you enter into these camps, there is a statement in German. I am not a German speaker, so I'm probably going to royally mess this up. So if anybody wants to correct me afterward, help me out with that. Uh, But it's, Erbeit mach frei. Erbeit mach frei. It means this, work makes free. Work makes free. And as those, uh, especially Jews, were brought into these concentration camps, they would go underneath that banner that says, work makes free. And that's the world that we live in. That's, That's the mentality that we often approach even our relationship with God with. Well, if I work hard enough, I can be at peace with God. Many times, it's the thing that keeps people from getting saved or having that personal relationship with God. Well, if I can do enough good works, then I can be free. Please understand that your peace with God never, ever depended on your work or your performance. Peace with God is really a wonderful idea. Most of us desire it. Deep down, it's like, yeah, I'd like to have peace with God. I'd like to know that I'm, I'm walking with God. But I, I think there's some things that disrupt us in this process. The first thing is work or performance orientation. We, we think we have to perform. We think we have to work. But it's very clear in this passage that, number one, the work that Christ has done for us brings about peace. What is the work that he did for us? Well, if you look even up in verse 23 of chapter 4, it says, Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because or for our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to kind of just zero in on verse 1 of chapter 5. Your justification was accomplished through Christ. Through Christ dying and then rising again from the grave. That's where you were justified. Now that's a big word, isn't it? Justified simply means this. It means to be made right. How many of you like to be right? Please raise your hand. All right, yes, okay. I like to be right. And when somebody tells me I'm wrong, usually this part of me grows inside of me and it's like, no, I'm not. Um, You know, 
every, I've had it happen a few times, admittedly, that, that um, a police officer will turn their lights on top of their car on behind me, okay? And immediately this thing rises up within me and saying, what did I do wrong? I was doing right. And sometimes they come up to me and they're like, um, give me your driver, um, registration of your vehicle. They'll start looking at it. And it's like, I just wanted to tell you your back light was out. It's like, oh, okay, okay, I can handle that. Or they'll be, do you know how fast you were going? It's like, um, no, okay. I like to be right. All of us like to be right. In fact, the whole world likes to be right. So when somebody comes along and says, you're wrong, they become defensive. We naturally become defensive when somebody says that we are wrong. And so when the Bible comes in and says, you are wrongly related to God, we're like, yeah, but look at all the things that I'm doing. Look at how well I play my instrument. Look at how many friends I have. Look at this, look at that. And once again, we establish our relationship with God not based on what he has done for us, but what we are trying to do by ourselves. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, it, I have a lot of favorite verses in the whole Bible, I'm sorry, okay? But Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, suddenly they knew that they were not right with God. What happened immediately? They felt guilt, they felt shame, and they felt fear. These are the three things that happened immediately when sin entered into God's created order. Guilt, shame, and fear. And those things immediately took Adam and Eve and they hid in the garden. Remember, God wasn't hiding from them. God came and walked in the garden and he said, where are you? Not that he didn't know where they were. But to point out the fact that they were hiding. They were hiding behind that which they thought could, could distance themselves from the rightness of God because they were not rightly related to God. Well, I want you to understand this very simple thing today. Justification means your rightness. And ultimate rightness only comes through Jesus Christ. It says again in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith. By faith in who? Jesus Christ. We see that in verse 24 and 25 of chapter 4. But the consequence of our justification, which is a once and done act, okay? Justification is a once and done act. Once you are justified, Romans 8, 1 takes effect in your life and it says, uh, therefore there is now no condemnation. Now that doesn't mean that other people around you don't condemn you. People do. I counsel people a whole bunch. And, and I like to point out Romans 8, 1, I'm like, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But that doesn't mean that other people don't condemn you. Sometimes you base your rightness on what other people are thinking about you. But when Jesus comes and declares you justified, right before him, the next natural consequence that we don't grasp, but is stated very clearly in verse 1 is, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace is a wonderful word. It feels good. It's a feel-good term, isn't it? I'm a wordy kind of guy, okay? I like words. I like languages. I like um, uh, uh, Hebrew and Greek especially. Greek is what I kind of concentrated in when I was in college. And um, What's interesting about the word uh, uh, peace in Greek is it's the word irene, okay? The root of the word is iros, okay? And the word iros means to join together. Now I want you to think about that, especially in context to the theme verse that, that you guys have plastered on the back of your camp shirts this week, okay? You see, 
the idea of joining together is something's been separated and you put it back together. Remember the theme verse says, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. It's putting back together something that was separated. We were all at one point or other in our lives enemies of God. And listen, you're going to lose if you're on the enemy side of God, okay? It's just bad news, okay? You want to take on somebody around here on camp in an arm wrestle, okay? Uh, You have a possibility of winning. You want to take on somebody in ultimate frisbee, you have a possibility of winning. You want to try to take on um, uh, somebody in a music competition, there's a possibility of you winning. But listen, if you are an enemy of God, there's no possibility of you winning. It is a fact, it is one of the uh, incredible parts of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost when he's speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem. And he said, you were looking for Messiah. He came, you missed him, you rejected him, you turned him over to the Roman authorities. He died, and now he's risen again. And there's an interesting verse that Peter quotes from the Old Testament. And he says, God has said that I will make my enemies my footstool. And what Peter is alluding to there is he's saying, all of you who have rejected Jesus Christ stand in a fixed position as enemies of God. And what is the response of the people on that day of Pentecost when they hear that message? They cry out, and they say, what then shall we do? What are we supposed to do? We are losers immediately if we're enemies of God. And Peter says, repent and be baptized, each one of you. It's really a simple thing. It's it's a change. It's a change of mindset. It's a change of understanding. You thought you could do it on your own. You thought you could do it by the law. You thought you could do it by your good works. You thought you could do it by your personality. And the Bible over and over again tells us, you are insufficient to change your standing before God Almighty, the Father and Creator of this world, without the intervention of Jesus Christ. But... When he intervenes, immediately our first benefit is we have peace, meaning we can come together with him. If you have, um, if you have two pieces of wood and you want to glue them together with, with glue, okay, do you take those two pieces of wood and run them through the dirt, the mud, the sand, and other things, and then uh, pour glue on them and try to stick them together? No. If you read the, the, the wood glue um, directions, it typically says, please clean the surface, maybe sand it up a little bit, but make it smooth. Remove the impurities. That's in some ways the way that Christ worked for us in our relationship to God. Christ was the glue that put us who were at enmity or enemies of God back together with God. And so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But... It doesn't end there. Notice in verse 2, through whom, okay, through Jesus Christ again, also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, there's two things in there. We, We need to understand that peace is an ongoing work of God in our lives. Every day we can wake up and it's like, Lord, thank you that I have peace with you. He gives it over and over. It's an abundant outflow of peace from God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The next two things in verse 2 talk to us about having obtained our introduction by faith into this grace uh, in which we stand. These two things are things that are settled and done. Okay, We have peace with God, but then we have access to the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So when we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Once you are justified, you get to enjoy peace with God, which gives you access to God's 
throne, the throne of grace, which then gives you an infinite access to his grace, day, night, 24, 7, 365 or 365.25 days every year. You see, you have now access to this grace. And the biggest reason that we don't access that grace, I think, is because we don't have peace with God or we're not accepting that God has given to us peace. Oh, I can't tell you. I can't tell you how important it is to accept what God says. Because God wants you to enjoy a relationship with him. But you know, one of the... What passage in the Bible talks to us about the spiritual armor? You ever know what that passage is? Yeah. Armor, armor. You got it. Ephesians chapter 6. And I love studying that passage. It's very fascinating to me. But one of the most fascinating pieces of armor is the thing that's on your feet, right? What does it say? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, many times when I've heard that, I've heard, you know, well, the Roman soldiers, they would put on their shoes and and they would have these little cleats in them and it would hold them tight to the ground so they could stand fast. And that's part of it. But I think what we often jump over is the gospel of peace. And I've thought about this a lot of times. I don't know if this is the best way to illustrate this, but uh, how many of you have ever not been at peace with somebody that you know? Please raise your hand. Okay. Now, it might be a roommate this week, all right? It might be. It might be somebody here at camp. More likely, though, is somebody at home, okay? And every now and then, I I remember when I was probably about four years old, um, I lied about something, and I had a babysitter, and I remember they found out that I lied. And you know what I did immediately? I started hiding. Okay, now I'm four years old. I'm running around the house trying to avoid the babysitter because they know that I have lied. Eventually I made it outside. I made it to this bush that had nice roses on it. I picked a rose for her. Okay? And I'm like, okay, if I confront her, I will give her my rose and it will make things better, right? Many times when our relationship is not right, we stay as far apart from that person as possible. When your relationship with God is not right, it's not at peace, it's not joined together, but it's separate, we tend to run away from God. We try to hide from him. Or we try to do what I did in our, our little four-year-old way is, well, maybe I can appease God by doing enough good things. Listen, whether saved or not saved, we all have this tendency to fall back into this trap. And so we have access to the grace through God. God's inviting us to come into his throne room to, to receive mercy and to find grace in the time of need. And this is what I want you to kind of end our thoughts with today. The work of justification that continually gives us peace with God. Okay, so the work that was accomplished through Christ continually gives us peace with God and the right to access his grace provides us with extraordinary worship. Now, again, I don't have a lot of time to dig into this, and I I won't, but I'm going to just give you kind of the the quick points of the next few verses in here. But I call this extraordinary worship because, first of all, understand this simple definition of worship. Worship is giving something of value of yourself to someone else to value them. Worship, in a very simple definition, is giving something of value of, from yourself to someone else. And so, yes, you know, singing is something of incredible value. 
Playing music is something of incredible value. Doing athletics is something of incredible value. And when we do it for God, we are worshiping Him because we're giving it to Him. When we are sacrificing ourselves for another person for the sake of God, we are worshiping God. But here's the thing. We need justification. We desire peace. We have, through that peace, then access to all that God has to give us in grace and mercy. And why do we need that? Well, let me just read the next few verses. For it says, And we exalt at the end of verse 2 in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exalt in tribulation or pressings. Uh, The word tribulation means to be pressed. Have you ever heard of the cliche, uh, uh, caught between a rock and a hard place? Listen, this is a stage of life that you guys are at. You are stuck between rocks and hard places day in and day out. Things that you expect and things that you don't expect. These are tribulations. But when we know that we're justified, when we know that we have peace, when we know we have access to God's grace day in and day out, when we face those pressing moments in our lives, we can worship. Extraordinary worship. Worship that is extraordinary because this is not the way the world worships God. Why would you worship a God when you're going through what you're going through right now? Why would you do that? Because I have peace with God. Because I've been justified. Because I have access to this grace. I can face whatever tribulation that comes my way because he's there. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, endurance, experience. Are all word definitions for this word, perseverance. Um, Listen, one of the things I respect deeply about you as a musician is one of the key characteristics of you is you are persevering in your musical pursuits. And the word persevere is a Greek word um, which has the idea of remaining under. (laughs) You remain under the mantle of practice and new pieces and uncomfortable situations time and time again. And the ones that persevere well they are the ones that enjoy the benefit there. But when it comes to life, God reminds us that when we face pressing trials in our lives, the things that uphold us during these times are we're justified, we have peace, and we have access to that grace in which we stand. And notice, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And then I will end in verse 5, and hope does not disappoint. Hope doesn't bring shame. This is not hope as the world hopes, where I hope something will happen. This is hope as God brings, which is, this is where my confidence lies, day in and day out. I will never be ashamed of putting my hope in God. One day, everything will be set right. Unlike the shame, the fear, and the guilt that Adam and Eve felt in the garden, you will never face that when you realize that you've been justified by faith through Jesus Christ, you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of his work, you have access to his grace. Extraordinary worship in times of tribulation will always lead to a greater robust hope that draws other people to our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these students these counselors, these staff members. And Father, let us please echo these words in our heart. Lord, as we struggle with our health, as we struggle with our perspectives, as we struggle with even our relationship to you at times, help us to be reminded of these wonderful, beautiful truths that perfect us into eternity by your gracious work. Lord, encourage these students today. Help them to develop deeper friendships because of those things that they go through today. And Lord, I pray that uh, we as a camp would bring great glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen.